Uh, my name is Bill Kolb. I'm the first floor manager at the San Francisco Public Library's main library and civic center. Uh, presenting today with uh, my associates uh, Ruben Juarez and Yana DeBrower. Uh, and uh, before we get started, we had some technical difficulties. I apologize for the late start. And I want to thank Suzanne Silva from Sonoma County Library for letting us borrow her laptop. Yay. Whoops. Yeah. So we're, we're here this evening to talk to you about um, moving your library from a focus on safety and security to a focus on a sense of well-being for your staff. Um, most public libraries um, have rules, lots of rules, um, some set of rules that is supposed to steer the public on how they're supposed to behave in your building. Uh, and no matter how many rules you have, and we do have a lot of them, um, people are going to run afoul of your rules. They're not going to follow them, um, and they're going to cause some sort of problem in your building. Um, and sometimes the problems that they cause are so severe that your staff is significantly negatively impacted. Uh, they experience violence in the workplace, they experience trauma, they see horrible things. Um, and you know, as a person who works at Civic Center in San Francisco, which is the, which is ground zero for Northern California's opioid crisis, um, we see a lot of stuff. And what we've been trying to do is systematically uh, address those issues in the moment and then work toward a sense of well-being for our staff. So I'm going to let um, Yana has been the uh, co-chair of our security and communications task force for what two years three years two. five two years. years a long time <laughs> and uh, she's done a lot of sort of amazing work to give us <coughs> some groundwork and foundation uh, to move forward with this process so I'm gonna let her take it over. Welcome everybody, uh, my name is Jana, and I would like to uh, talk about the multi-pronged approach to security that our organization took. So in 2014, um, I think it was, boy, time just flies when you are having fun writing security procedures, but um, we established, so the first thing that um, our library did is that we established um, Security and Communication Task Force. So um, it's a group of people, About we have about 20 members on that committee, it now turned into committee. And um, they come from different um, ethnic and cultural backgrounds and also they uh, come from different classifications across the organization. So this is really important, we have upper management, middle management, we have librarians, we have library techs, we have representation from our HR, we have training officer, um, we have union members. So, um, so as a group, um, we have been working together since um, 2014. And I feel that the composition of the task force has a real value for us because there's constant um, exchange of um, expertise and I feel that that really brings, um, that really adds to the success that the task force had. So in 2014, or actually 2013, I believe, um, we were in front of one of our um, initial tasks, which was um, to revise code of conduct. So pretty standard document, and as you can imagine, that was a long process um, as it involved um, all the community stakeholders. And thanks, Bill. <laughs> and. Um, Again, it was a long process, but as a, as a result, um, we do have a very solid document that library staff can refer to and enforce um, when the library um, behavior expectations are not met. So, um, so we started there with revisions of code of conduct, and then the next step that we took was implementation of um, incident tracker. So incident tracker is a software that helps us um, track the trends primarily of what's going on uh, organization-wide. So we have many branches, we are a big um, city library. So, um, so we raised the code of conduct, uh, implemented the incident tracker. So one of the reasons why we implemented the incident tracker was to track trends, but also it serves as a good communication tool among staff because um, anybody can log into the incident tracker and log in their incident report, but also see what else is happening in other locations. 
So um, then um, we developed a suspension form. So that is currently the only form that lives as a paper form. Uh, it's a triplicate form, um, and it also has appeal process uh, uh, instructions stapled to the back. So uh, people who decide to appeal library's decision uh, of suspension can actually follow those steps. So the document has also been translated into four uh, languages that are commonly spoken in San Francisco. So we have it, it's a, a print-on-demand translation. So library staff can use that. And um, currently, we have um, the document in Chinese, um, Spanish, Filipino, and Russian. And so uh, pretty early on, we realized, well, uh, we do have uh, excellent procedures, but how do we empower our staff so they can respond better in uh, these situations that are oftentimes scary and um, there's really no one good answer um, on how to react in certain situation. So we did several things. We started to offer trainings um, surrounding security. So we offered uh, de-escalation training uh, throughout the whole system. We offered um, self-defense training, which is like a four-hour training. And it, uh, we have had really positive feedback. It really empowers staff, especially women. Um, we had active shooter training. We extensively trained our security staff on um, a multi variety of um, different topics. And we also developed incident report writing training that I'm gonna talk about a little later. And so what happens when um, you are faced with a um, scary situation? How do you react? Do you call the police? Do you call security? Do you talk to the patron? Do you not talk to the patron, right? So. Code of Conduct is a very solid document. It has legal language. It's very clear, but not clear enough, right? So, um, so we took actually um, we took our um, patent code of conduct a little farther to support our staff, and we developed annotated code of conduct. So I'll share that a little later. Uh, I'll show you a sample of one annotation. So uh, this turned out that this was like almost two year effort from across the organization, um, we developed specific examples of what the what the what each violation means, and also uh, what the staff should do, like what what to do if this happens, how to prevent it, and such. So we'll look at the annotations um, in a minute. Uh, then, um, about in 2016. Um, there was a suggestion uh, from one of our staff who felt really strongly about being able to use Narcan in the library. So I'm sure it comes as no surprise that we do use Narcan in libraries in different places, different cities, right? Because that's part of our reality. Uh, so we actually, as a task force, um, initiated open forums. So all the staff from across the organization could actually attend open forum and voice their opinions and um, feelings about whether they, f whether they um, would like to um, have a training available to them on Naloxone. Um, so the, the feelings were mixed at the beginning. Um, people felt like, well, you know, that is not what I signed up for. I'm not going to be like reversing overdoses, forget it, right? And then there were people who um, were very interested in being able to do that and help. So. Um, so this was a kind of initiative that took several months. So after we had the open forums, we followed up with information sessions uh, with uh, Department of Health and DOPE, which is an organization that uh, helps uh, distribute um, Narcan. And after that, we actually initiated voluntary training um, for staff. So whoever was interested could actually take the training and then um, start um, using Naloxan. And Bill is actually going to talk more about drugs. So we'll let him do that. So he is going to address a little bit how, uh, how this is working for us at the moment, right? So uh, the implementation of Narcan kind of went hand in hand with uh, shards boxes being installed in our public bathrooms. And again, that's Bill. Um, and then, so. What happens if there is a very severe incident that involves violence, right? Physical violence, uh, 
how do we react? What should we do? So we decided that, um, to our experience, um, as an organization that um, we do have to have a different separate protocol for uh, how to communicate very severe incidents. So, um, so that was developed and then also my colleague Ruben here uh, took it a step farther and developed a list for supervisors that they can use so they would know how to respond to situation like that and how to support staff. So let's go back to annotated code of conduct, our 80 page document that lives on our staff net. So um, this is a sample of a violation number six. So this is one of uh, our commonly cited violations. Um, and so you can see this is the language that we actually have in the code of conduct. And that is using obscene or threatening language or words otherwise likely to provoke an immediate violent reaction. So that could be many things, right? Like what, what words, what language, like how do we define it, right? So, um, so we created actually specific examples that are supposed to help staff to determine like, is this really what's happening? Is this violation number six? So you can see it's language, tone of voice, body language. Um, it's not always the words that are threatening, right? So that's included there. But what we look for in this violation is the verbal threat of violence, right? Including, I'll see you outside, let's take it outside, I'll kick your ass, I'll mess you up, see you outside. So, um, but also uh, it can include raising a fist or getting too close, trying to be intimidating. Um, so this is, actually this continues. So then also since we do have um, codes that could be similar, but they are not necessarily violation number six, um, we created a list of things that are not it. So physical violence, right? That's much more severe violation that is not just a threat, it is actually physical violence. So that's not it. And we have like a whole list of things that um, we are saying, okay, this is not the violation number six. So um, to help staff out, we included required staff response. So of course, you know, we encourage people to use their best judgment, um, but here are some tips for the specific violations. So if this happens, what should you do? Right, because we get that a lot from, from newer staff, like, well, I wasn't really sure what to do, you know, I wasn't, I didn't know, you know, should I actually call police or, you know, what to do? So here it is, right? So there is a required staff response, which is more crucial in some of the more severe violations, but it is outlining what we would suggest for the staff to do, right? Or suggest actually we would require for staff to take action, and this is it. Uh, we have relevant laws here, so um, actually majority of our codes in our patent code of conduct are grounded in California Penal Code, so we cite it here. So staff can uh, further look at that, inquire, um, or um, refer patrons to, to that. Uh, so library staff response, so as you know, we have main library and then we also have other locations throughout the system. So, and the, the response can vary uh, sometimes based on where you are located. Maybe you don't have security on site. Well, what are you gonna do then, right? So, so that's outlined actually in the library staff response. So, and it continues, um, preventative measures. So we are in this situation and we don't wanna be in this situation again. How do we prevent it? Is there something we can do in the future so this wouldn't happen? So preventative measures are also outlined in the annotation. Um, but again, um, at every point we do encourage staff to just use their best judgment and do what's safe for them, right? So we also have similar codes here. So those are codes that, um, you know, that's like a little disambiguation. So uh, again, engaging in physical altercation, that is not violation number six. So there are, um, a few codes that will um, kind of help to disambiguate. Um, so now I wanna talk about incident report writing training. So that is something that um, we developed and it's a two hour training and um, why we did it, right? So we want staff to be supported and throughout, the, throughout our library system, we wanna make sure that we get um, high quality incident reports because um, 
it's a skill to write an incident report, and we are looking for specific things, right? Uh, but also during the training, we are um, actually teaching staff on how to handle difficult and dangerous situations and how to work together as a team to address that. So many times if you are dealing with a patron who is scary, I don't think you can actually take the description, good description. So here's your colleague who is standing by who can help you take the description. Another colleague can call security. Like um, this is a little bit of a cultural change, right? Um, but um, we are trying to really encourage people to um, be empowered and work together in the situation because that is the only way everybody's gonna stay safe, right? So um, again, that's part of the training. It's a, as I said, it's a two-hour uh, two training and uh, we teach people uh, how to observe and assess the situation. So we want them to um, be able to tell us like what violation, what code um, are we talking about here, right? Um, we uh, teach people how to take a good description and um, we also talk about how to utilize the incident tracker software to full capacity, how to, how to search for previous violations and so forth. And um, mostly how to write a factual non-biased report. So this is really hard in the heat of the moment. Uh, we have specific protocols actually we, de we developed um, incident report writing guidelines so people can refer to the guidelines when they write the incident report. So it's very clear like what the expectation is here. Um, so um, as part of the, so the incident report writing um, has one part which is about one hour and we go through all this. Uh, we um, talk about it, we look at samples of good incident reports and such. And the second part of the incident report, that's a hands-on part. So we actually watch a scenario, we watch a video, and then uh, people have to write the incident report and then we critique it and discuss it and such. So there's definitely extensive hands-on component in this and uh, we, we have noticed since we started offering the incident report writing training that there has been a little bit of improvement um, in the incident reports. So um, to conclude my part of the presentation, I would like to share a video that we developed as part of this training. So you can see what, um, okay, so, so again, uh, we wanna emphasize the value of the report because it serves as a witness during the appeal process. That's the only paper that we have to figure out what happened, right? So we really need this to be done well. So. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about the opioid crisis in San Francisco and um, um, Yana talked about us um, voluntarily deploying uh, Narcan when uh, we, wit we witnessed an overdose. Um, and uh, so that rolled out in June of 2017. Since that time, um, life-saving doses of Narcan have been deployed 17 times by library staff. Um, we've also experienced one overdose fatality in the main library um, in a restroom. Um, so the, those deployments have been in and around libraries, not all at the main, um, mo and all, entirely by uh, library security staff. That being said, um, my staff on the first floor and I are also trained, um, and I know a lot of, uh, we, we have a total of 151 staff people across the system who are trained in the use of Narcan. Um, the actual deployment of Narcan, really simple. It's just a nasal puffer, but the training is valuable because you learn when and why you should deploy this stuff. Um, we also installed um, Sharps boxes in our public restrooms, uh, and um, it, we have, in addition to noticing that we're finding sh uh, fewer hypodermic needles uh, in our buildings and around our buildings, um, we're also finding that fewer of them are getting flushed down our toilets, which is really uh, advantageous for janitorial staff. Um, uh, at one point we had a really large Sharps collection box outside of our building that was getting 3,000 needles a month. Um, and unfortunately we removed it recently because it was also creating bad behavior. It, it had so, sort of um, turned into an attractive nuisance. Um, so we took it out and there are two others that are within a block of our library. Uh, in Civic Center that um, are getting a lot of needles 
uh, on, a, on a monthly basis. Um, sort of the upshot of all this, the reason I'm talking to you about this is because we're witnessing people who are, uh, you know, in the throes of this o o opioid crisis, and they are fixing in our libraries, they're fixing on the streets outside of our buildings. Um, we're seeing them, you know, doing sort of horrible things in the streets because they don't really, they've sort of divorced themselves from the social contract. They're defecating on the sidewalk, they're naked, um, they're overdosing, and all of that is sort of violent behavior to library staff who are just trying to go to work. Um, and and peop our, our people are, are experiencing trauma as a result. Um, and uh, we're trying to, to find ways um, to sort of systematize empathy um, in, in the library's response to some of these things. And uh, Ruben is going to talk a little bit more about some other sort of traumatic uh, situations that we're facing. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Um, so Jana earlier was sharing a moderate incident uh, as defined by the annotated code of conduct. We just saw number six, I think it was. Um, Bill's going to be sharing, if the slide comes up, uh, a severe incident, which is kind of surreal as you read it. If you can make that out, bit the officer on the right hand, hit library page, right forearm, then hit another patron. Um, when you see these type of things, it definitely makes you pause. When Bill and I were talking about this slide, I said, Bill, did this really happen? And he said, yeah, it did. And I said, wow. That's the part where it's unfathomable, right? So um, today we're going to share with you, before we get to that slide, a checklist of what to do when supervisors deal with an attack on staff. Um, but first, we're going to talk a little bit about what do we know about attacks. They're spontaneous. They're unpredictable, and typically they're fast. If any one of you have either been witness to an attack or have had it happen to you, it's really jarring because um, all at once it's bam, and then you have an attack on your hand. What we hope with the checklist that we're going to show you shortly is that it can be the steadying hand during rough, turbulent waters, that you can take that with you when you're faced with a situation such as this. OK, so we're going to move forward to the checklist. Um, the first part of the checklist has to deal with attack happens, and I call it the law enforcement portion of it. What to say when you call 911. Um, uh, what to do with law enforcement when they arrive. You want to get the police report number. You want to get the officer's names. So that part of it. So that's the law enforcement part of it. Immediately after the attack, and I think the, our focus of, of this part of the presentation is, what do we do for our staffs? This is the key piece. We want to make sure that as supervisors, we show the concern to our staff. And in the form of things like, as Bill's <coughs> highlighting, do you want to take the rest of the day off? If you're going to be working today, maybe we can have you light duty. We want to do things that help them in the moment. Um, and the cr key crux to this is your supervisor um, showing that touch, right? Um, the other piece with this is uh, getting the uh, staff member the, the services they need. So in San Francisco, we have the Employee Assistance Program, um, which are, um, just giving their formal language here, one-on-one -on -one counseling for personal work-related concerns from licensed EAP therapists. They're fabulous. We had an incident that happened at my location, which is a small branch location in the Southwest District. There, there was a happening there. It was wonderful. He came in, and he was very um, astute about how he guided the conversation. If you don't want to say anything, you don't have to. 
But in the course of the conversation, people were sharing things, and it's very, it builds a lot of cohesion. The second principle about this is it's not only the staff member who's attacked, but it's also the people who work in that unit. So let's say I wasn't there that day, but my coworker was attacked. Now, I love Yana, and I care for her. So now I'm going to have feelings about that, right? So we want to make sure we get resources to those individuals as well. And then there's the third piece, which is I dare say some of the people in this room are either managers or supervisors. And often we wear the supervisor or manager hat. So, you know, we manage situations, we um, uh, deal with any assortment number of things. Uh, the, the word I'm thinking is not coming to me right now. Sorry. Um, it's when you note things down. That word is not coming to me. What's that? Document. We document, right? Does everybody know that word? Is this, <laughs> it, it failed in the moment, but I should know it so There's well. There's a glossary right? we'll share with you. Yeah. Um, following the chain of command. But um, you're dealing with something that you saw as well. And I, in an example that where we were meeting, the EAP person came out and met with our staff, um, I shared what, what I felt as well. So it builds that, that social fabric, that cohesion amongst us, that you know, we're all in the same boat together. Um, lastly, about this document, it's a living, breathing document. We share it with you that you can use it to whatever degree that you feel that works best for you. Typically, we have it at our circulation desk near our telephone. Um, so when it happens, you can have it available to you. Um, so yeah, uh, we offer that. And I'm now going to turn it back over to Bill to continue. And I just want to share that Ruben took the lead on getting this, uh, this document developed because um, we were seeing so many of these traumatic incidents in our libraries where, and, and supervisors didn't know how to react. They didn't know how to be empathetic. They knew how to fill out the forms, but they didn't know how to sort of work with staff to, um, to make sure that they were well. Uh, you, they were safe after the fact, but they weren't well. Um, and um, one, one of the, we had a very severe incident uh, a little over a year ago. Um, year and a half ago, July of 2017. Um, this is the view from the fifth floor stairway landing in the main library, and someone jumped from that spot into the middle of our, our atrium. And you can see that uh, there's a service desk over there. Two of my, my staff members work there every hour that we're open. Um, and um, one of them um, had a, a very uh, sort of matter-of-fact reaction to this in that he he walked out the next morning and he kind of took the space back for himself and he's been fine. The other one has been on this you know, year long journey um, through PTSD. He's severely traumatized and he's, he's really struggled. Um, and I, I think um, some of what Ruben worked so hard on in the checklist comes naturally to some people and it doesn't come naturally to others. So the point of the checklist is to sort of systematize that empathy piece. Um, and I, I, I feel like we could, get, we could go even farther with it. Um, but this, you know, this staff person that I have, um, um, I, I talk to him at least once a week and, and we're still in this ongoing journey of recovery for him and he's never gonna get there. He's seeing a counselor, but he has, I'm also his counselor in a way. Um, uh, so, um, I, I think I, I worked with Ruben uh, to sort of firm up the checklist because I felt I, I feel really strongly about you know kind of providing that empathy piece to the to the whole thing. Um, the other things that we did in reaction to this particular incident was we installed we installed these these safety barriers on the stairwell. Um, the, this building was in existence for over 20 years before anybody realized that maybe we shouldn't uh, let people have such free access to the stairway railing um, and then um, in, in the moment EAP came out as as Ruben mentioned um, and subsequently we had uh, an additional meeting where we got uh, staff together with a counselor and we all sat in a room together 
um, because there was a need to sort of share our experience. Um, I, people felt isolated. Um, they they didn't know um, they didn't know how bad it was for everybody else until we all sat down and talked about it. And like Ruben said, not everybody had to share, but uh, I think there's some sort of healing value in in letting other people tell their story and, and listening. Um, we marked the anniversary with a small gathering at the desk there, and that was another sort of moment where we took the space back. Um, we had some you know coffee and pastry, and we didn't talk about the incident. We were just there in, in community with each other. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, like I said, the staff person, um, one thing that we offered immediately was you, we can transfer you to another, another work location, another unit. Uh, and he feels very strongly that his, he has support from his team, so he wants to stay. Um, but I've also recently learned that he is no longer allowed to work at that, that staff point um, because of the trauma that he's experienced. So, um, like I said, Ruben's, Ruben's work to develop that that checklist has been so powerful for us as an organization because uh, subsequent severe incidents that we've had, um, people haven't been in the woods on this. They have like a sort of a, a, a plan to, to move forward. Um, and I want you to know that um, we have shared all of these documents on, uh, on, the, on the website. Oddly, in a zip file, because you can only upload one PDF. To, I don't know if anybody else has this weird document thing. But it's all there in a zip file, as annoying that, as that is. But um, we have a lot of documents that we're happy to share with you. And uh, we don't have a lot of time for questions, because we um, wasted that time with um, technical wizardry. But we're happy to answer any that, that you'd like to lob at. Those documents, they're on the um, the CLA website. CLA website. Yeah. They're not on SFPL. So actually, the code of conduct is on a public website, on SFPL website, but that's it. The rest of the documents are kind of internal documents, but right. they are sharing them for library purposes. Yeah, I can actually speak to that. So it was a huge effort, um, s systematic effort, and it took us about two years to complete it. So please use it. Uh, you know, we are happy to share it. We invested a lot of time in it. We would be very happy if others um, follow the example and or share the and, document. And I, as the manager of the first floor at the main, I, I deal with a lot of incidents because we're sort of, you know, the front door. Um, and that the annotated code of conduct, I think, is the most powerful document that we have because it really helps people. My favorite part of it is what it isn't. Like, it clearly delineates, like, that's not this. That's a different thing. And it's really helpful when you're trying to figure out where, how to assign an incident. Ruben is a union steward. Um, I am, I'm on the health and safety committee, so I'm the union person. So the, um, uh, okay, two things. One, the code, uh, the checklist that we uh, showed was a synthesized version because when we were discussing this, we thought we'd have something just in a little form like this that you could have at your desk but it's a much larger do document that the union and management came together, worked together to create. Um, uh, yeah, it was, a lot of it was a lot of work. It basically took one year. Um, different drafts came back. We had ideas, management had ideas that came back together and trying to support our staffs. Every we, I think everybody's in agreement with that. Yeah, management, the union labor. Was that we've come together, um, this is very important. Uh, it's been vetted. The, the security component, like I was saying about the 911 and all that kind of stuff, the security team, uh, we took things from every, everyone. So Marty Goddard, uh, in the spring of 2017, I took her versions of the resiliency training. And um, one thing I didn't mention was not only is there the employee assistance program, the Department of Public Health crisis line, the San Francisco Mental Health Warm Line, 
The library has a social worker, Leah Esquera, who is an internal resource. There is a lot in this, in this four-page document. And again, it's something that we offer that might be of help. So again, so we don't all have to reinvent the wheel. Um, but people came together. Yeah, and the union was really sort of supportive of the effort just to- Very uh, vocal. Yeah, uh, because it was, it was valuing staff in a really meaningful way. So it is called Incident Tracker, and uh, it is the software that we are using to um, to actually log in the incident reports. It has really strong analytical component. Uh, there are some other issues. Um, there are some components that are not as great, but it's it's a really good um, tool for analyzing the data that is gathered in the incident. Tracker. And what, one of the nice things about it is that it's kind of one-stop shopping for um, a after the fact. If, you, if, if someone is suspended and they come back into your library, um, we've got a picture there. We have their suspension notice that's uploaded. So if you get into that incident, now you, can get, you have access to all of those resources so you, you know how to deal with that, that person in, in that moment. Um, if, but the, our contact information is here. If you want to email me, I can, I can send you more information about Incident Tracker. No, it's a it's it's a vendor developed product, yeah, and it is off the shelf, and we're we've tried to not modify it too much because then um, subsequent updates don't have our um, our modifications. We try to use it out of the box as much as possible. Yeah. My, I mean, I don't have data on this, but um, my impression is that staff feels more valued um, and like there's sort of a, a really intentional effort on the part of the library to not just keep them safe, but be well. Um, and I know that um, my staff talks to me about stuff like this all the time. And, and one, I think one nice ancillary benefit has been that people are, are maybe more willing to talk about incidents that are happening um, because they know that there's kind of a community of care. Um, and we've really demonstrated that to them. So um, I think that people are talking and like taking care of each other a lot. And the staff person that I had who witnessed the, uh, the jump, I, like the, the way that the rest of, of his department loves him up is, is, is sort of beautiful. I just want to say here that um, since we started the incident uh, report writing training, actually we are involving staff across the organization. So um, people are being more aware and one of the good points about actually uh, training all staff on how to write the incident, um, we might not necessarily ask uh, a library page or shelver to write an incident report, but going through this training, they're more aware of how they can support their colleagues when the incident is happening. So I think that defi definitely there's something shifting, like people are more aware of what is going on and um, how to react and how they can support each other. I, I was gonna add to that, I think it's a work in progress. So with the checklist, it's a relatively new feature and um, Bill is a very empathetic manager. Um, each unit's a little different. We have 27 branches, so I think it's hard to say, but hopefully it's there and, and, and yeah. All right, thank you everyone.